Welcome to the Nature of Teaching Professional Development Webinar Series. My name is Lauren Tini, and I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Educator for Purdue Extension in Delaware County. Today's webinar is entitled Adaptations for Aquatic Amphibians. We'll be covering basic animal adaptations, amphibian biology, the Eastern Hellbender and their specific adaptations, and the importance of habitat health and quality to their survival. Joining me today is Nick Bergmeier, a research biologist in and Extension Wildlife Specialist in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources with Purdue University. Nick will be presenting the background information on animal adaptations in the Eastern Hellbender and finish up with the activities within the lesson and some quick tips. I will finish the webinar highlighting additional resources and the procedure to obtain your certificate of completion for this webinar. And with that, Nick, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so I'm just going to cover today basically uh, stuff about animal adaptations, uh, how specific adaptations for aquatic amphibians and the eastern hellbender, and then also how some of the things that humans do can impact hellbenders. So animal adaptations are basically just uh, inherited characteristics that can help a species change to improve their survival and, and reproduction. So examples of these are anything from, you know, migration and animals to go and, and travel long distances to find food sources or uh, spines to protect themselves from predators, uh, a whole range of things. They can really fall into two different broad categories of behavioral adaptations and physical adaptations. So a behavioral adaptation would just be changing how uh, an animal acts to help it uh, improve its chances for survival and reproduction, uh, while a physical adaptation would be changing something about its morphology or about its body to, to help it improve survival and reproduction. So behavioral adaptations, uh, I mentioned migration. Uh, that's that's a, a pretty common um, large scale behavioral adaptation that, that helps an animal uh, continue to find food during um, like a, a dry season or, or a cold season. Uh, other behaviors could be uh, changing your behavior to be nocturnal or come out at night. Uh, bats do this to, to help uh, exploit a, a, the, the various insects and moths that come out at night. Um, and then physical adaptations would be, uh, if we wanna stay on the bat theme, uh, they've, they've grown very large ears and, and various facial structures, and that helps them to take in sounds in their environment and really, really hone in on how they, how they track their prey and avoid obstacles as they, as they fly around in the dark. So acquiring food or avoiding being food are, are two of the, the big drivers of, of animal adaptations. And so those, those two main categories are, are predator and prey. And so predators are just, you know, anything that, that eats other animals. Uh, so wolves and uh, sharks and salamanders, those are all predators. And when they adapt, they're usually adapting things that are, that are key to their senses. So sight and hearing and, and their sense of smell. So, so back on bats, They've got those big ears. It really helps them to, to hear well and, and track down their prey. Or we've got this hellbender to the right. You can actually see its nostrils on the front of its face. And they have a very good sense of smell that helps them track down uh, crayfish and, and other prey items underwater. On the prey side of things, they tend to develop adaptations that either tell things that they shouldn't try to eat them or that if something does try to eat them it will harm them so uh, certain species uh, salamanders and a, a lot of amphibians uh, poison dart frogs they develop these really bright colors that signal to other species hey i'm brightly colored this means i'm poisonous you should not put me in your mouth um, other things like this toad you see those, it's got these large glands right behind its eyes. Those glands actually produce a poison. And if, you know, some of you have probably had your dog get a hold of a toad in the backyard, those glands release that poison. And it's very distasteful for predators and, and some species of toads, it can even actually kill the predators. So 
So these are just a few things that prey, prey animals have developed to avoid being eaten. Um, we're specifically going to focus on amphibians for this lesson. So just some real brief amphibian biology. You know, what is an amphibian? Amphibians are vertebrates. So, so all amphibians have a backbone. Uh, they are they're ectothermic or, you know, what most people call cold blooded. So their body temperature uh, is, is basically the same as their surrounding environment. They can't regulate it themselves. They have shell, shellless eggs. So you're, you're probably most familiar with bird eggs, which have a, a hard shell or even reptile eggs, which is more of a leathery shell. These uh, most amphibians, their eggs are just like little jelly blobs. So, so if you've ever had boba tea, that's a lot like um, an amphibian egg. Uh, so amphibian actually means double life. So that is a reference to the fact that they start out, most of them start out in the water uh, and then they end up at some point on land. And so this is, you know, the classic tadpole or frog tadpole where they, you know, you see the tadpole swimming around in the pond and then eventually they metamorphose into uh, the adult frog, which hops around on uh, at least on land near water. So I, I mentioned near water, all uh, hellbenders have, per or, sorry, all amphibians have permeable skin. I'm jumping ahead to the hellbenders. Uh, they, they all have permeable skin. And this just means that their skin, it, it can take in things from, from the outside. It's not like our skin, which, you know, if you pour something on it, for the most part, it sheds it. Uh, it can just absorb just about anything that's on it. Uh, amphibians, almost all of them have moist skin. And so they, they have to stay around wet areas or at least moist areas. And there are three groups of amphibians. There are the ones that we're most familiar with, which are frogs. And then there's also salamanders and, and something called Sicilians. And Sicilians are a tropical group that most people aren't familiar with. They really just look like giant worms, uh, but, but they're, they're not very well studied and most people aren't familiar with them. We don't have them in, in the Midwest. So as, as mentioned, many amphibians are, are they, they have to be near water and many of them are aquatic or semi-aquatic. And that leads us to the Eastern Halbander, which is a, is a fully aquatic salamander. So just some background on the hellbender. They're, they're North America's largest salamander. They're, they're up to five pounds. They can get up to almost 30 inches long. And they're a very long lived species. So up to 30 years in the wild and, and possibly uh, and longer in captivity. So, so they, don't, they don't grow very quickly. Uh, they don't mature until they're about six or eight years old. And hellbenders have very specific habitat requirements. So, so all habitat is is it's just basically all the food, the water, um, the shelter, and, and the space to rear young that, that a species needs. So it, for a hellbender, what they need are the cool, clean rivers and streams. So that's their, their water requirements. They, have, they need a gravel cobble substrate, which is part of their space needed to rear young requirement. Their, their larvae tend to burrow down into the rocks on the bottom of a stream. Uh, they, they need large boulders, which is where the, that's their shelter requirement. That's where the, the large adults and the juveniles live. And then they need crayfish and fish and other macro invertebrates for food. That's, that's their food requirement. Um, they, they pretty much, they mostly eat crayfish as adults and the, the larvae will also eat a lot of the smaller macro invertebrates, the, the little bugs that live on the bottom of the river. So hellbenders have numerous adaptations to live in a fully aquatic environment. Uh, one of which is, is camouflage. And this is a pretty good example of, of hellbender camouflage. If they are sitting on the bottom of a river, they are, they are very difficult to see. They blend in very well with, with the rocks and the, and the substrate on the bottom of the river. In case you can't see that one, it is right there. And this really just helps them to avoid predators. So Things that eat, would eat an adult hellbender, so a two foot long hellbender, are pretty limited, which uh, would be raccoons, otters, and, and maybe a really uh, lucky bald eagle or a heron that happens to, to find one in shallow water. But when they're little, when they're only a few inches long, just about anything will eat them. Other, other uh, hellbenders might eat them, crayfish, which, which their prey items end up being the predators, and, and other fish. So they also have skin folds and you can see those along the sides of the body. And those skin folds are an adaptation to help them absorb more oxygen. So 
hellbenders don't have gills once they get past about a year and a half old. So a year and a half on, they have no gills, but they, they spend all their time in water. So their method of breathing is to just absorb oxygen through their skin. And that's how they get all of their oxygen. They don't come out of the water. And so all those skin folds do it just, it's just extra space to take up oxygen. So it's just an extra surface area so they can absorb more oxygen. Uh, I mentioned smell earlier. Hellbenders do have a very good sense of smell, which allows them to, to find prey underwater. They actually don't see very well. So, so that, and they come out at night. So that extra sense of, that extra keen sense of smell helps them find their, their prey. It's hard to find a good image of hellbenders mouth uh, doing what what it does but hellbenders have a a very large mouth you can kind of see it's the entire width of their head and when they open it to eat things it's it's suction feeding uh, it's basically like a vacuum so they open their mouths if you've ever seen a whale eating on on a nature show where you see their throat expand that's pretty much exactly what a hellbender does only it it suctions its prey item right into its throat uh, in the back of its mouth into its throat but it's hard to find pictures of that uh, the, it's got these, this big paddle tail, which in the, in the inset photo, you can see it's, it's a big long tail that's flattened from the, the bottom to the top. And uh, you can, and it basically, if it needs to escape from a predator or it just needs to get from place to place, it can whip that tail side to side and uh, propel itself for, for several feet. And then finally, slime. So hellbenders and, and a lot of salamanders are, are very slimy, but hellbenders, when you agitate them, like this, this researcher had, was catching this to, uh, to examine it for any, any problems, uh, they really exude, they, they get irritated and they exude extra amounts of slime. And this is just, one, it feels strange and it, it makes them slippery and it would allow them to potentially slip away from a predator, but it's also distasteful. So, so it, it's an extra defense against predators. And this one was a very slimy hellbender. So that actually leads us into our first activity, which is the hellbender adapt adaptations activity. And so what this activity focuses on is showing students sort of uh, firsthand these, these various adaptations and then you know, dressing them up like a hellbender and and discussing with them how these things, you know, how this adaptation would affect their ability to live in the wild and, and uh, just really let them visualize what, what these adaptations are. Hi, I'm Nick Bergmeyer with Purdue University. And I'm Maddie Mackey. And today we're going to show you activity one from the adaptations for aquatic amphibians lesson plan. So the, the purpose behind this activity is to show students uh, the different adaptations that the eastern hellbender has developed to live uh, it's pretty much its entire life in rivers and streams and so what we'll do throughout this activity is we'll we'll essentially dress up a student uh, like a hellbender and we'll, we'll talk about the different uh, adaptations the different pieces of the costume once they put it on so the first thing that we would do is you would you would ask a, for a student volunteer, and when and, and my volunteer Maddie, uh, and when the volunteer comes up, the first thing you'll do is you'll you'll have them put on the this big shirt, and so this shirt uh, it's been painted with a little bit of black all over it, and the idea behind that is that uh, these this matches the hellbender's color, and the black paint on the shirt is is really the representation of camouflage. So you would. You would have the student put this on and then you could talk to the students about how uh, the camouflage helps hellbenders to avoid predators and to, to blend into the bottom of the river. And so after you talk a little bit about that, you can also throw in information about what eats hellbenders, things like otters and raccoons and, and fish. So then we'll move into the, the uh, clothespins. And so what we'll do with the clothespins is you'll you'll put three of those on one on, or three on each side, and that just helps make the skin folds for the hellbenders. So for this section, you'll talk about what those skin folds, how that that helps the hellbender breathe underwater. Um, so hellbenders, uh, they can't, they don't breathe air, they don't have gills, and you can just talk about how uh, that really helps the hellbender absorb extra oxygen as they, they never come out of the water. 
So next, we'll, well, you'll have your student put on the goggles. And what these goggles really are supposed to represent are the, the small eyes on the hellbenders. The hellbenders have very small eyes. They don't see very well. And so in this section, you'll talk about how the hellbenders use their other senses to, to navigate their environment. So instead of seeing with those tiny little eyes, they, they actually have a very good sense of smell. Uh, they can feel vibrations in the water. And so you can talk about how those things help them uh, move around their environment and especially find their, their prey. And you, you can talk about, give some examples of prey items such as crayfish and, and small fish. Next, uh, we'll talk about the, the hellbender's paddle-shaped tail. So you can just have them hold up a paddle, uh, anything that, that looks like, like it would make a good tail. And this is really to talk about how the hellbender uh, is adapted to, to swim and move around its environment. So that, that big paddle-shaped tail helps the hellbender uh, get leverage so it can, it can swing that tail really fast and it can, it can swim away from predators or, or get up to something that it, that it needs to move towards. So for the, for the final part of this, we'll, we'll talk about hellbender slime. And it's a good idea to pre-make this. We'll, we'll go over how to make this in activity three. But for now, all you really need to do is, is talk to students, uh, maybe let them feel it. It is pretty messy, but, but you can let them feel it, see what, it, see what it, a hellbender actually feels like. And you can talk about how this slime is really an adaptation to protect the hellbenders from predators and also potentially disease and how if, if a predator grabs a hold of something that's this slimy, they, they might be inclined to, to release it. And that's really the end of this, so, of this activity. So when you finish, you can just kind of wrap it up, uh, review some of those adaptations, and that's a good transition into activity two. You can, you'll discuss in activity two how some of these adaptations can help or hurt hellbenders when the water quality decreases. Right, so the next thing we want to talk about is water quality. Uh, water quality is very important for pretty much all organisms, but it's, it's especially important for humans and amphibians uh, because we are, we are so affected by the quality of the water that, that we have available. So with amphibians, since they are pretty much constantly required to stay moist and they have that permeable skin, if, if the water quality decreases, then it can it almost immediately affects the amphibians living in the area. As far as humans are concerned, you know, we have to get our fresh water from somewhere. And a lot of the times we like to recreate in the water. And if that water quality decreases, then you know, it, it can lead to problems with, with humans that use the water. So some of the parameters that we like to focus on, uh, these are really kind of the, the telling things as far as water quality are concerned. Uh, the first is dissolved oxygen, and this is basically just the oxygen available for organisms to use in the water. And if this, if this decreases, then it, it makes it harder for certain aquatic organisms to breathe. Uh, the next is conductivity, which is just the ability of the water to, to pass electricity through it, which, which sounds strange, but conductivity is affected by certain pollutants. So as conductivity rises in the river, that tells you that there are, there, are, there are pollutants that are getting into the river that are causing that conductivity to rise. Uh, and then the next uh, would be nutrients and pesticides. So these are two inputs uh, typically from agriculture and nutrients would be things like phosphorus and nitrogen that come from fertilizers. And the pesticides would be uh, just whatever pesticides they use on crops or you might use in your yard. And those things can, uh, the nutrients can affect the oxygen levels in the river and the pesticides can directly harm uh, aquatic organisms. So how this affects aquatic amphibians specifically is, as I mentioned, they have that permeable skin, which, which allows water and other substances to move through it. So if you have low oxygen levels, the, the low dissolved oxygen or high levels of chemicals, uh, it can lead to basically lead directly to death and disease. Uh, the, the hellbenders specifically, they require really high oxygen levels because they don't have the gills. Uh, and so if that oxygen level drops, then hellbenders can, they, they start getting stressed and they can die off. The same can be said for the chemicals. If the chemical activity or if the amount of chemicals in the water increases, 
then the hellbenders can just absorb that right into their bodies. And if it doesn't kill them, it will probably at least cause them additional stress or potential. They might have effects on their ability to reproduce. Uh, the nutrients, um, they don't usually directly affect the animal. It's not like the chemicals that they absorb through their skin, but what nutrients do is they're basically food for plants. So, you know, you put them on your farm fields to help your help crops grow. When they get in the water, it helps the algae grow. And you're probably all familiar with the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. That is a direct result of increased nutrients causing various uh, algae to grow and that depletes the oxygen level. And, and there's basically nothing can live there. This photo is of an al algal bloom in a, in a river. And what's happened here is there's just been an increase in nutrients. And so presumably that area is pretty low in oxygen and it's a place that that a lot of aquatic organisms wouldn't be able to live. So things like hellbenders and also trout and salmon, they, they need high oxygen, oxygen content. So hellbenders specifically, they are an indicator species for healthy ecosystems. So, so an indicator species is basically just a species that tells you something either positive or negative about your, about your environment. So what hellbenders tell you is if, if you have hellbenders in your river and they are uh, they have a healthy population that tells you that river has good water quality. There's almost a 0% chance that if you have a healthy population of hellbenders that there's something wrong with your river. However, if your hellbender population starts to disappear or it has disappeared, what that tells you is that something has changed in your river. Um, something has caused it to be to become unhealthy and, and it's likely that if you looked further into it, uh, there would be other species that were being affected as well. Um, so the, an ecosystem, I, I should mention, is just it's basically just the interconnected network of, of all living and non-living things in, in an area. So things like animals and plants and fungi, but also rocks and soil. So those, it's, it's just how everything interacts with each other. Now, human influences uh, have reduced hellbender populations and pretty severe, severely in a lot of areas. And one of the things as far as these adaptations are concerned that is if if a species can't adapt quickly enough to change uh, they'll likely go extinct and this is especially a problem with with human induced influences because most adaptations do not occur quickly enough to to account for the the human induced influences so so if something happens over a very long period of time a species might be able to adapt to the change but if you just completely change if, if there's chemicals getting in the river or or the oxygen level drops quickly a species doesn't have enough time uh, to, to account for those things they can't adapt and they and they go extinct so and, and this is one of the problems we've had with hellbenders is that they have been disappearing because of these changes and so they've led to protections in a lot of places so most most states actually all states uh, have some sort of program uh, if they have hellbenders, they are trying to protect them. And, and one of the reasons, or one of the things people ask us a lot, you know, why do we protect hellbenders? And there's a couple of reasons. Uh, but one of the main reasons that we protect hellbenders is that hellbenders are considered a, a keystone species. And so what a keystone species is, is a species that has a, a pretty significant effect on everything below it uh, in, in the, basically in the food chain. So if, if you remove a keystone species, then species below it start, you know, certain species become more common, other species become uh, less common, things get out of balance. And so for a hellbender, they're, they're a big predator on, and one of the main predators in whatever small streams they are found in. So, so if they disappear, then presumably the crayfish get out of, they actually probably explode and that affects the smaller macroinvertebrates in the river and, and it just leads to, to a lot of issues. Uh, and one of the other issues, or sorry, one of the other main reasons we protect hellbenders is that hellbenders can also be considered sort of an umbrella species. And what that is, is if you choose a certain species to protect and it's an umbrella species, whatever you do for it actually is good for almost all the other species in the area. So how we protect hellbenders is we have to improve water quality and improving water quality is basically it's good for all the fish it's good for all the macroinvertebrates in the river it's good for humans so choosing hellbenders as a species to protect really protects this entire suite of species and and uh, that helps you kind of get the most bang for your buck 
Now, some of the conservation activities that people can, especially just landowners can use to help protect hellbenders or other aquatic amphibians, uh, there's a handful. So we've got stream buffers, and this is a picture of a, of a nice stream buffer here. And what you'll see is you've got a stream and then around it on each side, you have this big strip of vegetation on that bottom end, you have a bunch of trees and on the top end, uh, you either have a bunch of trees or some, some smaller uh, uh, prairie. And what those stream buffers do is they help catch any sort of pollutants that would run off from that, from that farm field and prevent that from going into the river. So that they trap sediments and they, they stop chemicals and, and they really help improve water quality. And you can do this on a smaller scale. If you own just a backyard that runs into a small stream, you can leave a few strips of unmown grass and that will help catch any, any sort of pesticides you might spray on your lawn. It helps slow down the water that gets into the river, which actually helps prevent flooding. And so this is a really important one to, to help improve water quality. Uh, just generally picking up trash and not littering. Uh, you know, hellbenders, I mentioned, they do swallow things. So occasionally, you know, they could swallow plastic items, they can swallow fish hooks, and none of those things can really pass through a hellbender very well. Uh, reducing impervious services. This is a little bit of a hard one, uh, but there are, you know, impervious services are things that are non-porous. So think concrete and, and blacktop. And there, there are methods that landowners can use. They can, uh, they can, use pervious pavement, which is a, a type of pavement that allows water to pass through it. Uh, they can just generally try to reduce the amount of, of concrete they have on their properties, but this is a little bit difficult for landowners. It's, it's more of a, a large scale uh, fix. And then finally, there's installing rain barrels and rain gardens, which, which these are two methods that help reduce the amount of of runoff that is actually getting into the system. So rain barrels, it helps catch that rain that's coming off your roof and it's, it slows the amount of water that gets into, into, the, uh, into like a storm drain. And you can use that water to water your plants and, and reduce the amount of water usage you have to use coming straight from, from the tap. And then rain gardens are basically, it's, a, it's planting plants in, in like a wet area in your lawn. And what this helps do, what this helps do is it, it helps absorb any sort of contaminants that would get in that wet area and eventually run down into the water table or run out into a storm drain. And so that leads directly into activity two, which is our Herbie the Hellbender activity. And what we do with Herbie the Hellbender is you, you tell the story of Herbie, who is a, a juvenile Hellbender who's decided he wanted to uh, disperse away from where he was born and, and sort of experience new parts of the river. And as Herbie does this, he comes into contact with different human influenced landscapes. So he, he comes across a farm field and a golf course and roads, and he, he uh, experiences the different impacts that these have on, on a river system. Hi, my name is Emmy Chan. I'm an extension intern with the Nature of Teaching. And I'm Maddie Mackey, and I am a Hellbender technician at Purdue University. And today we'll be teaching you how to do Activity 2, which is the story of Herbie the Hellbender and how he leaves his state park to explore the areas around him. So for this activity, you're going to need a sponge hellbender, a clear container of water, some soil, food coloring, maple syrup, assorted trash, and a mixing utensil or stick in this case to mix everything together with. As you're telling the story, you can have students pour things into the container, mix, and this is a good way to get interaction with the students rather than just talking to them. Um, so first you put the hellbender in the water, and as the story goes, he first goes by a city park where he encounters trash, and the trash represents litter that park goers leave and can represent uh, choking hazards that it can produce for wildlife. Then he goes by a road which, uh, in which you'll pour the syrup in, and this represents oil runoff from the road which can interact with the hellbender's permeable skin, which you learn about in activity one. Thirdly, he goes by a golf course, which leaches chemicals and fertilizers into the river. The food coloring is a good indicator. And these chemicals can create an algal bloom in the river, which can make it harder for animals and hellbenders in the water to breathe. 
Lastly, he goes by a farm in which you'll put in soil, and the soil represents sedimentation, which can happen near farms. This sediment will settle to the bottom of the river and take up space that baby hellbenders would use to hide from predators and just hang out. At the end, you can pull out your sponge hellbender and see that he is kind of dirty and he looks different than when he went in. You can use this opportunity to talk about indicator species with your students, what they are and how hellbenders act as indicator species in our rivers. So that's the end of activity two. Thank you for watching. And if you're interested in learning how to make slime, check out our video on activity three. And for our final activity, we have uh, slime making. And this is just an opportunity for hellbenders to, to make some hellbender slime and get a feel for what that might actually feel like. And it's really simple. It's just a, a mixture of cornstarch, dish soap, and water. And, but the important part for this other than for the students to have fun and make a mess, is this is their opportunity to ask questions. So we encourage you to walk around and talk to the students and, and see if they have any questions about what you've talked about and use this time to just sort of reinforce those, those lessons. Hi, I'm Maddie Mackey and I'm a Hellbender technician at Purdue University. And in activity three, we're gonna learn how to make Hellbender slime. So everything that you'll need is gonna need, you're gonna need water, cornstarch, uh, any type of dish soap, and some measuring cups. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is put in a half a cup of cornstarch. The second thing is going to put a fourth of a cup of dish soap. And the last thing you're going to put in is a, or a tablespoon of water. And then you're going to mix it together. And you want the consistency to be kind of watery to mimic hellbender. Uh, slime, so you may need to add a little bit more water. And while you're doing this, you can take the opportunity to teach your students um, how the hellbenders use the slime towards their predators such as raccoons or otters. Right. And I actually made some pre-made slime, so the texture is supposed to be pretty watery, so it kind of falls down like this. And I do suggest having towels around because it will get pretty messy. But yeah, that's all you really need to make Hellbender slime. Thanks for listening. All right. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for the Nature of Teaching Professional Development webinar entitled Adaptations for Aquatic Amphibians. Um, I hope you would consider participating in many of our other webinars through the Nature of Teaching. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar, I encourage you to click on the card in the top right of your screen um, to visit our Nature of Teaching YouTube channel. Here you can view sneak peeks of lesson plans that are directly related to the webinar you just completed. To obtain your certificate of completion for this 30 minute webinar, please click on the second card in the top right of your screen. Here you will be directed to a short Qualtrics survey to provide us some feedback on the program. Once that is completed, you will automatically uh, be emailed your certificate of completion, which you can see here. Um, we hope you enjoyed learning with us and consider participating in additional professional development webinars offered by the Nature Teaching Team. Until then, thank you for engaging with our youth and future.